Well, good evening, church. I really appreciate you coming out on this uh, significant holiday uh, that is October 31st. First, it's my mother's birthday. She would have been 95 years old today. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's your birthday too. Happy birthday. And most importantly, it's Reformation Day. Martin Luther did not nail 95 Reese's to the door. He nailed 95 theses. So, anyway, I had a friend that gave me that joke, and I'm like, I don't know that I could ever tell that. That's pretty bad. But anyway, I'm really, really glad to be with you all today. What a wonderful presence of the Lord that's already here tonight. Amazing this morning. I just have to shout out to some friends of mine that we go back way back into the 70s. We were in each other's weddings, and they are Ben Womberg's parents, the amazing Steve and Annie Womberg. They're right over here. Wave your hands, guys. We have shared so much together and have stayed great friends, even though for most of our, uh, you know, our, our 40-some years of married life, we have stayed distances apart, but certainly not in heart. Um, one young man that is attending here that I was surprised to meet, and um, I planted a church in my hometown of Chillicothe, Illinois, from 1986 until 1998. And in one of the, uh, we moved around quite a bit. As a matter of fact, in one year, we moved between three different places seven times. So that's the life of a church planter. And uh, in one of those, we were in a, a daycare center. And uh, a couple that uh, became great friends and great supporters of my ministry, uh, Don and Billy Hayes, uh, his, were his grandparents. And that's your drummer tonight, the amazing Kelly. I was originally from Chillicothe, Illinois. So, Kelly, I just love you. What an amazing surprise. The last time I saw Kelly, he was about this high or so, and uh, I had the privilege of, of uh, participating in the wedding of his uh, mom and stepdad so many years ago. Oh, my gosh. But uh, it's a small world. How many of you know the kingdom is really a small world, isn't it? So anyway, everybody take a real deep breath. And I want to pray and I'll introduce myself again. Father, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for the power of your presence in this place right now. Holy Spirit, as we venture into dealing with the broken heart of man and the trauma that so many of us have experienced at one time or other in our lives, I ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and guard us and guide us. I ask you for those angels that you send with me to be here in this room and the angels that are assigned to this church to be here. Under the authority of uh, Pastor Connie, I speak uh, against and I take authority over every demonic work, the powers of darkness that would seek to come to distract that would seek to come to divide, that would seek to come in any way, shape, or form to uh, prevent the powerful moving of Holy Spirit in this room tonight through our being distracted by triggers or by things that come from the powers of darkness. So in Jesus' name, I command the spirits of trauma, the spirits of torment, and the spirits of fear to leave here. We bind you with the strong chains of the blood of Jesus. We break the power of the spirits of suicide and of death, of depression, of panic and anxiety, and we command you to leave in Jesus' name. Also break the power of the spirit of unbelief. Declare that where there is unbelief, it is hard to receive the truth of who the Father is and what he's provided for us. So I just declare spirit of unbelief is broken off of everyone in this room in Jesus' name so we can have clarity in our thinking and our receiving all that the Holy Spirit has for us. So, Father, we just cover this time together with the blood of Jesus Christ, and thank you for your healing angels that have already entered the room. Thank you, Jesus, that you are here. In your name we pray. Amen. So, my name is Mike Hutchings. I'm a boy from Illinois. I uh, was raised in a Baptist church and eventually received the call of God 
in the mid-70s to go into pastoral ministry. I went to Judson, which was then college, and then university in Elgin, Illinois, and then went to Northern Seminary, which the Wombergs, we have this in common that we were in school together. Um, in the uh, early 80s, I moved to Southern Illinois, where I pastored uh, a church that was a sister church to Dr. Randy Clark. Uh, he was in another church that was part of our denomination. We got to meet each other and know one another in 1983. In 1984, we were both touched by the Holy Spirit and just began this amazing journey of discovering how much more there is in God, right? How many of you are still on that journey? Anybody? It's an amazing journey. It's a wonderful adventure. It's an incredible discovery, and it's also very uncomfortable. It's also very uncomfortable because just when you get God figured out, right? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, He never changes, but our understanding of Him changes because we get greater revelation of who He is and what He wants to do in our lives. And I, I can say that Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 uh, really is a, a banner verse over my life that says, And our God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask or think, according to the riches of His glory and His power, that is at work within us, not work outwork someplace else, but is at work within us. So I was asked by Dr. Randy Clark, uh, at a, I, was, I pastored for 35 years, and then he asked if I would come and direct his education programs at Global Awakening. And after some initial resistance, uh, I said yes, because I was really happy where I was. I was enjoying pastoring, and everything was great. But I would rather obey God than stay in a comfortable place. I've learned that when you try to stay in, an, in a... When you disobey God by trying to stay in a comfortable place, that place eventually becomes very uncomfortable. Could I get an agreement in the room, anybody? Is that true? So I moved out to Pennsylvania in May of 2012 and been serving uh, Dr. Clark and Global Awakening for nine and a half years now. Uh, during uh, that service, I was asked by Randy if I would pray for an Iraqi war veteran who suffered from symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder from his service in Iraq and in Somalia. And uh, the, the short version of it is I had no clue what to pray. Uh, Randy, Randy stood with me as I prayed for this man, but Randy wanted me to pray for him. And uh, I, as I began to pray for him, I just asked the Holy Spirit, what do you want to do here? And as I began to receive impressions from the Holy Spirit, he began to give me impressions about what to pray. And in the midst of that, uh, this uh, Iraqi war veteran, his name was Ron, got completely set free of all of his symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Slept uh, more than eight hours uh, that night for the first time in over five years. Got rid of all of his chronic nerve pain, all of his depression and panic, anxiety and uh, began his own ministry of ministering to veterans. Uh, so that has begun a journey of discovering what God wants to do with trauma. Uh, let me say this to you. We, we heard this this morning, but for those of you that weren't here, Jesus was sent by God to bring good news to the poor, the afflicted, the traumatized, and the victimized. He was sent by God to bring healing to the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, and declare liberty to prisoners and to literally bring healing to the shattering of our soul that takes place through sin, that takes place through the trauma in our lives, and that there is freedom in Jesus' name. Could I get an agreement from everybody in the room? So tonight I want to take you through just a, a short version of uh, the seminar. We're actually going to be doing some of it tonight, tomorrow morning, and then tomorrow night we're going to go into a, a real in-depth understanding of what true freedom is and how free God really wants us to be. So that's going to be an amazing time. So obviously we're going to do tonight, tomorrow, and then tomorrow night we're going to have some extended time for ministry. But I do want to let you know of the resources that are on the back table just so that you know. First of all, my book that took four and a half years to write, and I finally got it done. It's called Supernatural Freedom, 
from the captivity of trauma, and that's back there. And then because we're learning that people no longer have DVD players and CD players. How many of you know that that's old technology? So we've had to move to some new stuff. So I have USB drives back there that these shiny ones uh, are the five and a half hours of teaching. That's the entire PTSD healing trauma seminar, part of which I'm going to give to you tonight. And that's back there. All you have to do is plug it into your computer, and you have the entire video seminar. And also this uh, USB, there are some CDs back there, but uh, this one is developing a kingdom mindset, which is the full teaching that I give at the very beginning of Global School of Supernatural Ministry, helping people step into thinking like the kingdom. How many of you know that you're not going to see the things of the kingdom until you think like the kingdom? And so that's, that's what that teaching is about. Also back there, there are laminated prayer cards that have the prayer model I'm going to walk you through today. And then this booklet that is actually contained in the book has the prayer completely written out so that you literally all you have to do is read it and uh, bring freedom to yourself or to others. So could I have the PowerPoint? There it is. Healing from the Wounds of Life and War. So this morning, if you'll remember, next slide please, we talked a little bit about this verse, Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. And we define trauma, for those of you that, you, that weren't here, not as a mental illness, not as a mental disorder, but as a wound as literally what I call a soul injury, that your soul has been injured by the things that have happened to you. And in the midst of that, you begin to believe things about God, about yourself, about what's available to you that are all framed by the experience of your trauma. You begin to believe that your history defines who you really are. And we, we looked at the, the parable of the Good Samaritan and how he saw that the man was traumatized or traumatizo, and he ministered and bound up his traumas or his wounds. So when you come to understand that whether you've been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress or whether you carry just around some unresolved trauma that may go all the way back to the womb, Ultimately, you need to understand something. You may have been diagnosed by a medical professional, a counseling professional, a psychological professional as having all these disorders, but I'm telling you that many of those are simply unresolved trauma. Now, let that sink in for a minute. That you need to understand something. I, I, am, I believe in the medical community. I believe in the psychological community, I believe that they bring good, good things to people. But all they can do is look at the symptoms that you have and then give you a diagnosis. And unfortunately for many of us, particularly for those who uh, have been in the counseling profession, all we can do is simply hear what you're suffering with and say, well, I think you have this or I, I think you have that. That becomes a real issue when you're particularly in the military or you're a first responder, a police officer, a firefighter, or emergency medical technician, because to be labeled as suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder is considered a weakness. It's considered, uh, it becomes a label by which your entire career and your identity is formed by that diagnosis, post-traumatic stress disorder. I, when I first started teaching this seminar, I called it healing PTSD. And many people would not come to the seminar because they thought that it only dealt with military folks or first responders. But what I came to understand that there's a whole lot of folks that carry all the symptoms of post-traumatic stress. They've just not been diagnosed. And they're suffering just as much as, every, as all those who've been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And the reality is, is that most folks don't want the label of PTSD on their lives. They don't want that. They actually want to be set free. But unfortunately, for much of the, of the medical and counseling community, they consider carrying unresolved trauma 
or having post-traumatic stress as being a traumatic brain injury by which you will never be healed of. So what they do is they give you medicine and they give you counseling and they help you cope. And once again, thank God for all of the tools that are used to help people. But listen to me. This scripture is true. Not only is God near to the brokenhearted, but God heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Could I get an agreement in the room, anybody? I want to take you a little bit as we come to understand the effect that trauma has on a person's life. I want to take you just a little bit into the story of David and in his journey. And if you go to the next slide for me. I consider David, uh, of course, the David that I'm talking about is the David who was the shepherd boy, the David who was the, the giant slayer, uh, the, the young man that played the harp for Saul when he was going crazy, when he was demonized. He was also the one that was persecuted by Saul and was literally on the run for years. He eventually was not only, he was anointed king, but eventually became king. But I consider David, honestly, to be the most traumatized man in the whole Bible next to Jesus. Because David's story is all about trauma. And in looking at David, we see the two types of trauma that most people carry in one form or another. So the first time we see David is in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And if you've read your Old Testament, if you've read 1 Samuel, you know that Saul, through his rebellion against God, has lost the kingship of Israel. And so God dispatches Samuel to go to the house of Jesse to anoint the new king of Israel. Now, God, in his wonderfully mysterious way, doesn't tell Samuel exactly who the young man will be. He just says, go there and anoint one of the sons, and I'll tell you. I think God loves it when we're dependent upon him. Could I get an agreement, anybody? That we, instead of having our own program or think we know what we're going to do, he actually wants us to listen to him. And that's a journey that I'm still learning. Anybody else? So <clears throat> he goes to the house of Jesse, and he tells Jesse to bring out all of his sons. So Jesse brings out, in quotes, all of his sons. And Samuel goes down the line, and each, each young man looks like an amazing leader, looks like he'd be awesome as the king of Israel. But God says, nope, 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 nope. He goes all the way down the line. He finally turns to Jesse and says, hey, somebody's missing. What's up? And Jesse says, well, there's David. And in the fact, not only that Jesse did not bring David in to that meeting, but also in something David said later on in Psalm 51, many Bible commentators believe that David was not considered a full son of the house. He was possibly the product of another relationship between his father Jesse and another woman. And so therefore, when, he was, when Jesse was commanded by Samuel to bring out his sons, there was something about David that he was not considered one of those sons, not just his youth. Later on, when David is writing Psalm 51, which is the, um, the psalm of confession, the prayer of confession after his adultery with Bathsheba, he says this one line. It says, in sin, my mother conceived me. Now, if David had been conceived in a marriage between a husband and a wife, that's not a sin. There's no sin in that. But it's interesting that that line comes up in the midst of him uh, confessing his sin of adultery. And so there's this, and I, and I used this line this morning, I'll say it again, there's this sense that David was like the red-headed stepchild, in that he was the... the um, the son that was not considered to be a first-class citizen of the house. Um, that's significant for this reason. Many of us know what it is to be raised in homes where we weren't fully accepted for who we are. 
we know what it's like to live uh, in, in a house where maybe our parents call, said that we were an accident or we were a surprise. Or, you know, I've even prayed for people whose parents said that they were a mistake. And in the midst of that comes this, this trauma to the human soul that is the sense of who I am down to the very core of my being and existence is not really accepted. You know, when we're parents, we're supposed to give our children just some basic soul nutrients so that they grow up to be really emotionally healthy people. It's called resilience. It's calling the ability to be resilient in life and, and to be a strong person. So the first of those soul nutrients is, first of all, the sense that you really do belong, that you belong in this family, that you're truly accepted. The second one is that you really are loved, not for what you do, but simply for who you are. We love you for who you are. You are amazing son. You're an amazing daughter simply for who you are. The third thing we give them is a sense of an identity. Guys, you don't send your kids off to college so that they get an identity. They get their identity from their families. They get their identity from, from knowing who they are, who their family is, and who they are. And finally, the fourth soul nutrient that's very important, that they have a sense that they are significant, they have a purpose, and they have a future. When you don't get that from your parents, when you don't get the sense of being, of truly belonging, of truly being loved, of truly having an identity, of truly feeling significant, you actually experience trauma at that level. And many trauma experts, and I'll just give it a really clinical name, will call it trauma A, okay? And trauma A is the absence of good things. That is, there were things that as a child you were supposed to be given, but because you didn't get those, there was a weakness in your soul that developed, a lack of resilience. The term resilience simply means to have the strength of soul to be able to handle all the stuff that life brings to you. And when you don't get that, you carry trauma in your life. You, you, you wander about with a sense of a lack of identity. Many times you have difficulty dealing with all of the, the difficulties of life. I don't know if you've ever met anybody that, you know, no matter what happens to them, it's like, why does everything bad happen to me? I mean, it can be a flat tire. It can be a, a hangnail. It can be everything. But there's just this sense that they're identified by all the bad stuff that happens to them. And many times that comes simply because they didn't get the kind of soul nutrients that they needed to be a healthy individual in a healthy family situation. The absence of good things. Obviously, if you think about it, I know there's some folks that I met this morning that have worked in foster care. And so this is a big thing with foster children. This is a big thing with, with children who maybe have... Uh, did not know their parents in the first place or maybe went bounced around from home to home. I worked in foster care as an intensive therapy specialist for five years, and so I know, I know what those children deal with, just dealing with the lack of identity, the lack of belonging, the lack of, of feeling significant, instead feeling like a burden on everybody. That's, guys, that's traumatizing. And there's many of you in this room that know that. The next time we see David is the very next chapter, and it's in 1 Samuel 17. You know how 1 Samuel 16 ends up. Jesse finally calls David down from the hills, and he comes in, and God says, he's the one. So Samuel anoints him as king, and you would think, well, everything's rosy for David right now. But the next thing we see is, the next time we see David is uh, instead of being, you know, the the, the star of the family, you know, kind of being hoisted on the shoulders and celebrated for being the next king of Israel. The next time we see David, he's the Jimmy John's delivery boy for his brothers. He's being sent up to the front where the army of Israel is standing against the army of the Philistines, and they're in a stalemate. So David takes lunch up to his brothers. And in that whole scenario, you know, 
that that's where Goliath is brought forth by the Philistines, and he challenges Israel to bring forth their champion. And everybody in Israel, the army of Israel, are scared to death. So David, because of his amazing relationship with God, and by the way, let me say this to you. Just because you weren't accepted by your family doesn't mean that you can't have an amazing relationship with God that helps fill in all of those gaps. That's what we see in David's life. We see that even David, even though David wasn't treated properly by his family, that he had this amazing relationship with God. And out of that amazing relationship with God, he had a strong faith in God. He had a strong, strong belief in who he was. And he was able to overcome that trauma and stand as a mighty young man of God. So he goes up there and he's hearing Goliath's curses and he says, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go challenge this guy. They try to put on other armor and other gear and all that other stuff. And he says, no, I'm going to use what I know. I'm going to take my slingshot. He takes the first shot, knocks Goliath in the head, and Goliath falls down and he's face down in the ground. And for those of us that were brought up by parents that taught us parables and Bible stories or we heard Bible stories in Sunday school, that would be the end of the story. But how many of you know it's not the end of the story? That David takes Goliath's sword and cuts off his head. And that head becomes a trophy that the armies of Israel carry around for a while to let the Philistines know that they won. And I know you've heard amazing messages about being a giant slayer and killing giants and all that other stuff. There's just one problem here. Teenage boys aren't supposed to be going around cutting people's heads off. And what David becomes, he, he, he goes from being a shepherd boy praising God, giving praises and singing to God, to being anointed king of Israel, to now being somebody who celebrated that later on Saul becomes so jealous of him that it says that Saul has slain his thousands, but David is tens of thousands. So David becomes a bloody man of war. So much so that later on, decades later, when he's considering building a temple for God, God says, I'm sorry, I can't let you build that temple because the temple is supposed to be built in, with a, with, by somebody who is a man of peace and you have way too much blood on your hands. David begins to experience what it means to be a warrior and becoming the champion of Israel. Uh, one of my fate, honestly, one thing that tells you what kind of a man David was, was Saul, who was jealous of David, wanted to trap David and wanted to actually wanted to see him killed because he was so jealous of him. So Saul had promised his daughter to David to marry him, but he told David he had to go out and get a dowry because David didn't have a dowry. So he told David to go out and get 100 foreskins from the Philistines. David comes back with 200 foreskins of the Philistines. And ladies, let me just say this. In order to get a foreskin from a man, you're going to have to kill him. I'm just going to say that right now. You're, you're going to have to kill him. He's not, he's not going to give it away. He's not just going to give it to you. So David knew what it was to literally kill hundreds, if not thousands, of people. And once again, we read of the great battles and the great victories and all of the other stuff. But there's just one problem. War was never part of God's plan for this earth. Hatred and bloodshed and violence was never part of God's plan for this earth. And he never constructed our souls to be able to withstand the horrors of war. And all the bad things that happen in this life, whether they be war, whether they be violence, whether they be Death, whether it be disasters, natural or unnatural, whether they be things like hurricanes or tornadoes or earthquakes, whether it be racism or just, just the kind of unrest that we've seen in our country over this last year and a half, all those are bad things that were never part of God's plan for our life. And so when you've experienced a bad thing in your life, 
you experience trauma B, which is the presence of bad things. That is, there's things that have happened to you or there are things that you have witnessed that impact you in such a way that it literally shatters your soul. It, it impacts your memory in a way that you actually can remember those horrific events by simply being triggered by something that you see, smell, taste, touch, or feel. And in the midst of that, you begin to feel like you're a captive to the things that has either been done to you or things that you have witnessed. These things come, and they literally reside in your memory in such a way that it's hard for you to have great faith in a loving father. It's hard for you to attach yourself to people, and you can have a tendency to isolate yourself from folks. There's, there's lots of things that proceed from this simply because your mind, your will, your emotions, and your identity have been affected by all the bad things that have happened to you. My father and three of my uncles were in World War II. My dad's only and older brother, his name was George Boone Hutchings, and he was in the Civilian Conservation Corps during the Depression. But when Pearl Harbor happened, he immediately signed up for the Army. He, was, he didn't wait for the draft. He was a volunteer. He trained at Fort Dix, New Jersey, and he was uh, deployed with the Allied forces in North Africa where their first skirmishes and the, the battles took place against Rommel, the Desert Fox, and the, the German forces. And if you know anything about World War II history, you know that those first skirmishes were not good for the Allies. The German forces had superior firepower. And uh, in the midst of that superior firepower, we lost a lot of troops. It was kind of a back off. They had to back off and regroup again. And in the midst of one of those, my uncle was severely injured was placed into a military hospital. And then due to his injuries, he was eventually shipped back to, back to Fort Dix, New Jersey, where eventually his physical wounds healed. But he suffered from something they called back then called shell shock. And he spent the remaining years of, his, of World War II in a military psychiatric hospital. Unfortunately, back then, our government wasn't as keen on recognizing the problem of post-traumatic stress or shell shock. And my uncle uh, was discharged with a less than honorable discharge from the Army, which meant he didn't get any veterans benefits. And he was basically told to just go live by yourself, don't go get married, and just, just be by yourself. He went and married his high school sweetheart right after he got out. And six months later, they were divorced. My uncle lived a whole life as a single person. He had trouble with alcoholism. He was one of the kindest men that I knew. He actually, uh, he moved near my family and became like a second father to me. And when he was in his right mind, he was probably one of the kindest, most generous people that I knew. But it would be like something would flip a switch. And all of a sudden, he would become angry, raging. Uh, he would isolate himself for months on end. And it was like he would become a different person. And he carried, even though he finally he came to Christ and he served, he was in the church and he loved Jesus, he carried the torment of all of that wound for the rest of his days. And my mom gave me a a devotional that she had given to him after he passed away, and it was A.W. Tozier, day-by-day -day devotional. And at the bottom of each page was a blank space. And I read through my uncle's journaling of his conversations with God, how much shame, 
how much guilt, how much condemnation he carried, crying out to God to please forgive him, to take away his torment, to take away his pain. And I realize that one of the reasons why I do what I do today, because we never knew what that was. We just knew that he carried it home from the war. But what I understand today is the reason why I get to do what I do today is to restore back to my family what was stolen from us. Could I get an agreement in the room, anybody? You need to understand that no matter, particularly if you've had something bad happen to you, whether you've been abused as a child, physically, sexually, emotionally, whether you know what it is to be in a domestic relationship where you've been abused and wounded, maybe you've been uh, a vet, a a military veteran, a first responder, or you've been in situations where you've experienced such a horrific event that it's still, you still carry it. It's still with you. It's, you, can, you can flash back to it in a minute. A lot of times people ask me, well, I don't, I don't remember if I've had any trauma, but I have all the symptoms. Well, that tells me that you're probably blocking a lot of that trauma uh, away from you you, you can't remember it. Uh, but here's the good news. Go to the next slide for me, please. God heals all shattered hearts, and he binds up their wounds. So next slide, please. To be brokenhearted means to have a shattered soul. When you experience the effects of trauma, these are not a mental illness. They're not a mental disorder, but they're actually a soul injury. One of the most incredible things that I've learned over this last eight or so years of this journey is that I've learned that a lot of people get diagnosed with all sorts of things. They get diagnosed with bipolar disorder. They get diagnosed with learning disabilities. They get diagnosed with ADHD. They get diagnosed with lots of other things. But when you bring healing to the trauma that they still carry, all of those symptoms resolve. Because so much of what we've called mental illness and mental disorder is actually unresolved trauma. Now, not everything, but many things. And when you understand that when your soul is shattered, that is, when your mind, when your will, when your emotions, and when your identity is affected by the things that have happened to you, the way that people have treated you, then it begins to affect and impact every single thing about your life. I was talking with a lady today. She came up to me and she has said to me that her mother used to call her ugly all the time. I looked her in the eye and I say, you know, that's not true of you. That you're beautiful. That you've always been beautiful. And unfortunately, your mother was in so much pain, she couldn't see the beauty of who you are. You see, we, we need to understand something, brothers and sisters. And, and by the way, R.C., thank you for singing the song, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. We need to understand this. The most significant people in our lives that have shaped our identity and who we are by all the bad things they said about us and by all the things that they spoke over us were never part of God's plan for your life. My brother over here was reminding me today that, you know, we, we've got to know who we are. But first of all, we've got to know who God is. We've got to know our God is a loving Father. He's not a punishing God. He's not a judgmental God. He's not an angry God. As Mike Bickle says, he's not a mad God. He's not a sad God. But he's a glad God. Amen? And so when we go, to, you know, I, I can remember, uh, even with my own father, I wasn't, when I went to my father, I wasn't always sure what mood I was going to get because my mom, my dad had lots of different moods. And so, you know, it's like I'm not sure if I can go or not. Thank God that's not the kind of father that we have in heaven, that indeed he's a father that when we go to him, he is always full of love. He's always full of joy. He's always full of compassion. He's always full of mercy. He's always about loving us in the way that he originally designed us to love. That's who our father God truly is. And unfortunately, there's a lot of bad religion out there. Anybody know bad religion? 
Bad religion says, yeah, God loves you enough to save you, to take you to heaven. But in the meantime, he puts things like cancer on you. He puts you in car accidents. He brings tornadoes your way to teach you a lesson so you'll be a better Christian. And guys, I want to say this to you. That's bad religion. I also call that church trauma. <laughs> How many know there's a lot of church trauma, right? A lot of, as a matter of fact, that's what my next book is going to be on, is on getting free of all the church trauma on both sides of, the, on both sides of it. Um, but let's, let's be clear about something. God has always had a dream for your life. He's always had the best plan for your life. But you've also had an enemy that's been out to steal, kill, and destroy the dream of God for your life. And unfortunately, many of us were born into families that were full of pain. Born into situations that actually brought pain to us. But let's understand something. That God's desire has always been about restoration and healing and transformation and freedom so that we can live out the fullness of the dream of God, who we are as children of God. We are truly beloved children of God. So when, next slide, when Isaiah declares that the mission of Jesus is that the Spirit of the Lord God would be upon him because the Lord has anointed him to bring good news to the afflicted, to, to, God has sent Jesus to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. And then to do in a divine exchange of comfort for mourning, for a garland of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness and joy instead of sorrow, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness and fainting, so that they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. This is an amazing, what I call, instead of ministry of Jesus, is that all of the trauma, all of the pain, all of the sorrow, all of that, all of the shame, the guilt, the condemnation, all of that he trades by the power of his blood, the shedding of his blood on the cross. Do you know that the three main emotions that most people who carry unresolved trauma carry are number one, shame. Shame says there's something bad about you. In other words, there's something in the makeup of your identity that you deserve all the bad that's happened to you. And so you carry shame. You carry shame not only for what's happened to you, but you carry shame for just being who you are. I don't know if you've ever felt that, but it is the most soul-destroying feeling in the whole world. And my friends, this whole world out there is covered in shame. They may act evil and wicked and dark and partying and whatever you want to call it. But deep inside, without Jesus, they are covered in shame. Shame says there's something bad about me. Number two, the second most prevalent emotion for people who carry unresolved trauma is guilt. And guilt says, I've done something bad, therefore I'm being punished. So people, and I, I've, I've prayed for so many of them, they said, I have spent my life trying to figure out what I did bad that made God punish me this way. And I say to them, what if it wasn't God punishing you at all? What if the dream of God is so vast and big for you that you've had an enemy that's been trying to destroy the dream of your life for all of your life. And it's not about what you've done. As a matter of fact, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, everything that you've ever done, no matter how wicked and bad it is, it's as if it never happened because Jesus' blood cleanses white as snow. Amen? The third emotion is condemnation. Condemnation says, you're hopeless, you'll never change. There's people in this room tonight that you've struggled 
with stuff. You've struggled with addictions. You've struggled with sin. You've struggled with all sorts of things. And you, you, come, you, get, you kind of get to the place that you're tired of the struggle. You're tired of the fight. You're just, you're just tired. And so you kind of give in and say, okay, well, this is what my, the rest of my life is going to look like. I, and and that's, there's a hopelessness that's in that. You know, I, I, I've encountered people in my own family who encounter hopelessness through situations that never seem to, to change. But God's Word declares to us, there is therefore now no condemnation because we are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. So guys, we're always changing. We can always get better. As a matter of fact, our best days are yet ahead of us in Jesus' name. I don't care how old you are. The dream of God is still alive for us. Amen? So I have an amazing assistant up there that's running my slides. And I want her to just go next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. We're going to get into this tomorrow a little bit. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, this, we're going to get into that tomorrow. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. There it is. So in Japanese art, they have this amazing thing. You know, in America, when something breaks, you just throw it away and go get a new thing. But in Japanese art culture, they have this amazing thing called kintsukuroi or kintsugi. And when a piece of pottery or a vase is broken, instead of taking that piece of art and throwing it away, they take the pieces and they use gold or silver lacquer and they put the pieces back together. So that by the time they're done with this amazing process, not only is that piece of pottery or that bowl or that vase back to its original design that the creator designed it to be. But it's actually more beautiful and more valuable for having been broken. This is a demonstration of Romans chapter 8, verse 28, where it says, God works all things together for our good, for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. It means that God, he wants to take the gold of heaven. And he wants to take the pieces of your shattered soul. And he wants to bring you into a place where you experience what it means to be the real you. The real you. The real you that he designed you to be. Because you see, you're not defined by how people have treated you. You're not defined by what your parents said about you. You're not defined by what other abusive authority in your life has said about you. You're not defined by any of that. You're defined by who your father calls you. I'll just say it again. You're defined by who your father calls you. So how do we minister to somebody who carries trauma? How do we bring them to a place where they're actually able to believe that? Go to the next slide, would you please? I love this piece. It's a picture of a broken heart that has had the gold of heaven been, been brought to them. So how we do this, and, and we're, we're going to walk through this actually t tonight and tomorrow, is we minister to them personally. We actually look them in the eye, and we begin to declare the purposes and promises of God over their life. So the first thing I do, go to the next slide if you would. Next slide. Thank you. Is you ask and, and you interview. You, you ask them what their most significant trauma is. Secondly, you, you explain that you're going to pray for them and, and, and bring the promises of God into their life and, and minister to them. And then you declare God's forgiveness over them. You declare over them that if they've accepted the work of Jesus Christ into their life, that they're forgiven, that all of their sin has been completely forgiven by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And then as you declare God's promises, you break the power of shame, guilt, and condemnation off of them in the name of Jesus 
and declare liberty and freedom to their bondage. That, for instance, if they've been sexually violated and abused as a child, you sever the soul ties between them and the people that, that have abused you. You break off the power of the lies that they have begun to believe. You also go after the, the demonic forces, the, as I did earlier tonight, the spirit of trauma, the spirit of fear, the, the spirit of suicide that is so prevalent in so many people who carry unresolved trauma. You go after those demonic spirits, and you don't have to yell at them. How many, guys, how many of you know you don't have to yell at demons? When I talk to demons, I smile at them. Because demons don't respond to volume. They respond to authority. By the way, I don't like being yelled at anyway. <clears throat> Somebody's ministering to me with that. I had somebody come up and begin to scream at me and try to cast a demon out of me. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, stop, stop, stop. First of all, I don't think I have it. And number two, quit yelling at me. I don't like to be yelled at. And they, so they prayed for me. And so they began to pray for me. And, and sure enough, something popped up that I was listening to a lie, and I, I got free of it. So it's amazing what, we'll do, what God will do when we actually listen to him. Then when we, when, we, when we go after those demons, then the main thing we want to get to is praying for their shattered soul. Heal their broken heart. And as I said this morning again tonight, that your soul is made up of the way you think, the way you feel, the way you make choices, and of your identity. And in the midst of that, as we pray for healing of the soul, we also pray for the healing of their memories. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to walk you through how to, how to pray for those memories. But listen to me. You can actually be free of all the traumatic memories of your life. Your, God brings healing and restoration to all the memories that have continued to plague you, the nightmares, the night terrors, all of that that have plagued you your whole life. He brings healing and restoration to that. And I'm going to demonstrate that for you in just a few minutes. And then finally, we ask Holy Spirit to come and fill every place that trauma has occupied. And then finally, we reset their identity. I want to show you a video. It's a pretty long video. It's about 10 minutes. But it's uh, one of the very first people that I ever prayed for, for post-traumatic stress. And I prayed for him out at Bethel Church in Redding, California. This is video number three, video number three that we're going to show. And this is, uh, you'll hear this hey, testimony. How you doing? Let me tell you first about what happened a few weeks ago, and then what, now I'll let Adrian tell about last night. How many uh, veterans of the uh, wars in the Middle East do we have in our presence tonight? If you've served in Iraq or Afghanistan, somewhere in the Middle East, would you just lift your hand once we have any... Um, You know, this war, like all wars, has casualties. Sometimes it's more than shrapnel. And one of the huge things that we're facing as a country is so many uh, veterans coming back with PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And a few, uh, several weeks ago, uh, a young man came up to us in Illinois at a large vineyard, and he... He, he told me, um, you got to pray for me. I've, ever since I came back from Iraq, I've had night sweats, and I've had terrible dreams, and I've been tormented every night, and my life has been miserable. And it's, uh, and, and so, and it's, it's so bad, his wife is going to have to have surgery as well. And so Mike, our director of our school, he, uh, he was with me. I said, Mike, pray. And as he began to pray, Something happened to this man named Ron, who was a veteran. And the next day, he met us and said, I had no night terrors, no night sweats. I have been at peace. And my wife was healed when she was facing back surgery for, in her lumbar area. She got healed at the same time. This is now weeks later. We're still getting emails from him. And not only that, but he has such, had such a healing, not one problem since then that he is praying for all the veterans in the church that they too would be healed of the PTSD. 
So last, was it last night you came up? Monday. Monday night, Adrian here came up, I believe it was right there, or somewhere right in there, and I knelt down and I asked, what do you need? And, and he told me. So you take it to, from there and tell us what's happened. Well, Monday night when Mr. Clark was handing out the books, he had handed out a book on identity, and that's why I had to get to him. And I knew I could went to the bookstore and get it, but something kept telling me, no, you need to go ask Randy Clark what the title of that book was. And you need to ask him specifically. And I was like, no, no, I'm just going to go to the bookstore. But anyway, I made my way up here. The, the crowds parted like the Red Sea because I didn't know how I was getting here. And I asked him the title of the book, and he told me. And he said, well, why do you need it? I said, I lost my identity quite a few wars ago, and I was trying to find myself. And he said, you don't need that book. Let me call up a team member to pray for you. Yeah. But what was even better was that I think... I don't know, I'm speaking on your behalf, but I feel that he sensed that if he left me to wait for the team member, I was bolting for the door <laughs> because I was scared, I was terrified, I was getting surrounded by the crowds, I was nervous, I wanted to get out of here, I was looking for a threat. But he didn't let me go, he took his mic off and he sat with me. Can't thank you enough for doing that oh. for me. Before I go on, there is freedom in Jesus. <clears throat> I didn't come here to get prayer for PTSD. I've come here because I've been living with chronic nerve pain in my arms and legs for the last five years, five plus years now, until tonight. And I met a couple in Lubbock, Texas, not where I'm from, but where I retired to, that was from, associated with Bethel, and they prayed for me, and that was the first time I ever experienced real prayer. That's when my breakthrough started was April of 2011. By September of 2011, I came to visit the healing rooms. I was in a lot of pain. I, I just looked at my medicine records a few days ago. I had six or seven sheets of medicine with about 15 to 20 meds per sheet that I've been on in the last uh, five plus years. Long story short, I was seeing breakthrough and it was coming, but it was slow. It didn't happen overnight. Sometimes it would go away and it would come back. So I'm thinking... Why do I have to deal with this PTSD? I came here for my nerve pain. God, what is going on? I want this pain out of my body because it's like cutting yourself with razor blades, having acid poured on your skin and your bones crushed 24-7. You can't breathe. I couldn't play with my kids. I couldn't be with my wife. I lost my love of music because the, the, the sound and the vibration was so intense. I have to sit at the back of the church or by the exit. I couldn't stand bright lights, so my senses kind of got dull. All that's gone. And <laughs> so when Mike came and, and prayed for you, uh, did, did what happened? Uh, Mike came and prayed for me, and he held on to my wrist, and I started to panic because I did not want to be restrained. And I think I could take Mike. He's a big guy, but I think I could take him, <laughs> even in my weakened state. But what Mike did for me and what Jesus did through Mike to me was he made me look at his eyes and he wouldn't let me put my head down and I kept wanting to put my head down because I didn't realize the guilt and the shame I was carrying from the horrific and horrible events that I cannot even put into words nor do I want to because I don't see those images anymore and I don't feel that pain. <laughs> On the 10th of January, I went to my doctor with my wife. You know, I've been about 100 different doctors and specialists for my nerves and the PTSD, and I asked him, I said, uh, does PTSD ever go away? You know, can it be cured? Is there medicine? What's the answer? Because, I, I, you know, I'm always thinking about taking my life. I'm always, and everything's intense for me and my family. And they said, no, you don't ever lose PTSD. Well, the devil is a lie, and so is that doctor. <laughs> Amen. 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 So Monday night, I, yeah, I got prayer from Mike, and as he was praying for me, I was crying. I was sweating, he, and I kept putting my head down. He said, look at my face. I said, don't tell me what to do. And <laughs> he's like, I'm not letting you go until you look at me. And so he just kind of walked me through the stages, and I can't even tell you what all of them were. 
But it was a short prayer. It was only five minutes. It wasn't nothing deep, but it was like Jesus was touching my hand and he was speaking to me. And I felt a peace that I haven't felt since I was probably a young child. And I walked in the door of my house Monday night and I kind of floated in the house, I guess. <laughs> and my wife said to me, she said, Dave, what happened? I said, I'm free. <laughs> I'm free. Let's stand and praise the Lord for Dave's and freedom. <laughs> so happy for you. And you couldn't have normally got up in front of this many people and stood in the light, could you? Hey, man, you are free. Yeah. Okay. My wife told me, she said, Dave, it looks like you've lost 2,000 pounds off your shoulders, and I don't know who you are because she's only lived with me since I've had this PTSD. She's lived through the nightmare. She's lived through being attacked in my sleep. She's lived in fear. My kids have dealt with it. She's lived through all the medication. But since then, in the last two days, I've played with my kids. I've held them. I've hugged them. I haven't been afraid of what's on TV, what's outside. And even better, when I, before I came here tonight, I just got to say this. I was still having the pain in my wrist, but I said, God, you've been so good. You've already brought me through. You got me out of bed. You got me out of the wheelchair. You got me off all these medications and narcotics. And tonight, when I go there, it's going to be done. And I don't need prayer because I'm just going there to glorify what you did for me. As I was sitting in the lobby over there at five minutes to six, I was sitting there waiting for him to open the doors. And all of a sudden, I felt my left hand. And I looked down and I was like, hand? You're back. And nobody prayed for me. There was no worship going on. I got on the phone and I called my wife and I said, thank you, Jesus. Not only am I at peace, I have no more pain. I can touch my hands. I can clap my hands. I can feel my fingers. I can dance. And the music didn't hurt me. The legs don't hurt me. The devil's alive. Jesus came me. Father God is so great. He brought me home. My Father in heaven, thank you for bringing me home and rescuing me and giving me So for years, for years, I've always ended that testimony by saying, you get free of PTSD and you become a preacher, right? That's what it is. And then earlier this last year, I received a message from Adrian that he had gone through a ministry training program and he got his credentials to be a pastor. He is now serving as a police chaplain in his community and ministering to the police and ministering to those. So somebody give thanks to God. That's restoration as far as I'm concerned. It's, it's really important, and I'm gonna show, I want to show one other video because it's, it's important that we not focus, although obviously our military and first responders have huge, huge trauma things that, that, uh, that haunt them. Uh, just normal, everyday people like you and me can also have it. And I like to show that number, I believe it's Jeannie, is number five. Could we just show that video real quick? And this is a lady that was literally just watching my seminar on a seminar that was You can happening. get healed from anything. I was healed from things that I thought I was going to have to live with for the rest of my life. happened up there but it did and it was like oh god those wounds on my soul gone just gone all the years of it being so um opened up and, and gory and then it would start to heal and rip back open gone. i didn't know it could happen like that many traumas reliving um nightmares attacks had gotten so bad that they were morphing into different kind for years that they had been the same and I knew what to expect but they were turning into 
something really, really out there. Dealing with the symptoms of PTSD, I would grind my teeth when I did when I tried to sleep, and I was at the dentist, and they were saying, "Yeah, you need to go and get you a mouth guard." And I said, "I don't need a mouth guard anymore. I don't grind my teeth." And they said, "What? You don't grind your teeth? You've been grinding your teeth for a very long time." I said, "I don't do it anymore. I don't need one." What do you mean? I said, "I was healed. I was healed." of the symptoms of PTSD and I don't grind my teeth. I was completely and utterly healed July the 22nd. And so I came and watching the video, it was just amazing. And there's these hardened veteran guys standing up there and they're, and they're saying stuff and just, I don't know, the power from their testimony did something in me, and I was like, if they can, if they can do it, I can do this, because the living with it was the hard part, not <laughs> being freed from it, that was easy, and now I've got to tell everybody, because it's real, it's real. So Jeannie now works in a women's shelter, and guess what she does all day? She she prays for women who have been abused and molested and are, have been abandoned. And she has seen hundreds of women set free from post-traumatic stress disorder and be set in life again in Jesus' name. So tomorrow morning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you all the details of walking you through that prayer. But tonight, I just want to pray for you. I want Tonight, many of you, are going to be able to go home tonight and sleep all night with no nightmares, no night terrors. Tonight, you're going to walk out of here with a huge load off of you, the load of trauma that you've carried your whole life. And you're going to know what it is to be completely free, not because I'm praying, but because it is your Father's desire that you live the rest of your life free so that you're no longer defined by your history. So that you're no longer defined what, by, by how, what others have done to you. So that you no longer are defined by your reactions. So many of us look in, are, we have difficulty looking at ourselves in the mirror. Because we actually have hatred towards that person on the other side of the mirror. And we hate them because we know us. We know how we react. And we don't like us. But I have some good news for you tonight. God loves you. He loves that person on the other side of the mirror. And you're going to change what you say to that person on the other side of the mirror. You're going to start saying, I love you. And you're going to be praying to God and say, God, help me to love that person on the other side of the mirror like you love them. Because you see, God knows more about you than you know about yourself. And he has committed to love you with all of his heart. He is committed for you to experience all of the blessings, all of the favor, all of the love that he has ever desired for you. So put your notes down. Get ready to receive prayer. You can sit exactly where you are. But the only thing I want to ask you to do is keep your eyes on me while I pray for you. The Spirit of the living God is here right now. And I'm going to walk you through this prayer. And during it, you may get triggered by some things. You may start to feel a little bit of a panic or anxiety. You may have already experienced that while I was, while I was speaking tonight. But that's the Holy Spirit pointing out those places that he wants to heal. So if, as you look at me, I'm going to pray for you right now. Holy Spirit, come in power right now. In Jesus' name. I thank you, Father, for every one of your sons and daughters that are in this room right now in Jesus' name. I plead the blood of Jesus over all of us, and I just declare right now we are, if we've accepted the work of Jesus Christ on the cross for the forgiveness of our sin, then we truly are completely forgiven. There is nothing between us and you, Father. So in the name of Jesus, 
I just declare you're forgiven. You're completely set free from all of your past sin in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Because of that, I address the shame that says there's something bad about you, the guilt that says you've done something wrong and therefore you're being punished, and the condemnation that says you're hopeless. I declare in Jesus' name all of those emotions, I break their power over your life. I break the lie of shame and guilt and condemnation over you right now in Jesus' name. And I declare that's no longer an emotion that is legal in your life. It's no longer legal in your life in the name of Jesus. And even now, as the Holy Spirit begins to minister to you, that he's replacing shame with acceptance and love. He's replacing guilt with forgiveness. And he's replacing condemnation with faith and hope in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, I'm going to ask you to do one thing before we go any farther. And that is, if there's anybody in your life that has wounded you, that has abused you, who has hurt you in any way, the same grace that brought forgiveness to you, I want you to receive that same grace to forgive them. So I'm going to ask you to do something. Close your eyes for just a moment. Everybody in the room, just close your eyes. And if Holy Spirit brings up anybody in your life, any face, any name, just pray just silently to yourself. Father, I forgive them. You forgive them. I release them. That's all you have to pray. Father, I forgive them. You forgive them. I release them. It's not saying what they did to you was right or it's okay. But it's letting go of what was done to you so that you can be free. So just take a moment to do that, please. Just do business with the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm going to ask you to open your eyes again. If there are more people that you need to forgive, you can do that when you leave here tonight. Release them. But listen to me. And, and I know that Dr. Connie has taught this, but I can't emphasize enough. If you want to be free, if you really want to be free from what people have done to you, you need to release them and cut the bondage between you and them. As long as you hold on forgiveness and bitterness towards them, you will be in bondage to that which happened to you. But Jesus said he'd come tonight to set the captives free and to declare release to the prisoners in Jesus' name. Now, everybody look at me. By the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, I sever and I cancel every work of darkness against you. I sever by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ the spirit of trauma, the spirit of torment, and the spirit of fear in Jesus' name. Declare this with me. We did this this morning, but let's do it again. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I have a sound mind because I have the mind of Christ. Therefore, I think God's thoughts and I'm not going crazy. Now let me go after those some more spirits. In the name of Jesus, I sever and I cancel every demonic spirit of death. I break the power of the spirit of suicide. And I break and I cancel the, the spirit of depression and panic. It is over many of your lives in Jesus' name. I cancel and I sever that assignment in Jesus' name. I also sever every soul tie between you and any person that either sexually 
violated you, abused you, or you were in a relationship that was outside of a marriage covenant. In the name of Jesus, I sever that soul tie between you and all those people in Jesus' name. And I close the door of access that the demons that were on them that are on you. In Jesus' name, I close the door of access to the spirit of lust, to the spirit of perversion, to the spirit of pornography in the name of Jesus. And I close the door of access that they no longer can have access to you any longer. And you are free. You are free. You are free from the experience of that violation and those sexual encounters in the name of Jesus. Now put your hand, your right hand, right here on your heart. In Jesus' name, I speak healing to your soul. I command healing to your mind, the way you think. I command healing to your emotions, the way you feel. I command healing to your will, the way you choose. And I speak restoration of the original dream of God for your identity in Jesus' name. That you would begin to live as a beloved child of God. That you would begin to live as a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That you would live with the blessing of knowing that you belong to a family, and that is the family of God. That you've been adopted, you've been accepted, you are beloved, that all of the riches of heaven are at your disposal in Jesus' name. Everybody look at me while I say this to you, because you've got to look at me to believe it. In Jesus' name, I'm saying to you that your shattered heart is being healed, and the gold of heaven is putting the pieces back together, back to the original design for which he created you for, in the name of Jesus. So I release your soul from torment in the name of Jesus. I release your soul from the effects of trauma in the name of Jesus. And that you would begin to experience the true shalom of God, which is not just peace, but it's wholeness. Shalom means wholeness in every area of life. Wholeness in your emotions. Wholeness in your thinking. Wholeness in your decisions. Wholeness in your identity. Wholeness in your relationships. Wholeness in your finances. Wholeness in every area of your life that has wounded you. And that shalom would just bring complete restoration to your soul in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Take the same hand and put it right back here. Neuroscience tells us that all the traumatic images and memories that we still carry are back here in the right quadrant of the brain and that they actually keep us from remembering all the good things about our lives because they hijack our memory process. So look at me when I pray for you. In the name of Jesus, I speak to every traumatic image and memory that you carry. And automatically, I'm, I'm seeing sexual assault and rape. I'm seeing physical abuse. I'm seeing mourning, seeing the tragic death of people, of being in accidents, of being in disasters, of, of being, uh, of literally uh, being in situations and accidents where you nearly died. And in the name of Jesus, I speak to every traumatic image and memory and I command it to dry up and die right now in Jesus' name. I sever the neural pathway that leads to those traumatic images and memories. And I sever your five senses, your seeing, your smelling, your tasting, your touching, and your hearing from being triggers to those traumatic images and memories. I speak healing to your memory center. And I say, wake up, wake up, wake up. Let there come a free flow of memory from your hippocampus, which is your memory center, to your, the right lobe of your brain, through to your uh, prefrontal cortex, that in the name of Jesus, you're going to get your short-term memory back. You're going to begin to remember where you put your car, your phone, and your keys in Jesus' name. You're going to begin to remember the good things about your life again in Jesus' name because you haven't lost your memories because of your age. You've, you've lost your access to your memories because of these traumatic images and memories. Holy Spirit, bring healing 
to this portion of the brain, and I speak to your sleep centers. And in Jesus' name, I speak a reset of your sleep centers back to pre-trauma levels in Jesus' name and a restoration of the circadian rhythms of sleep in Jesus' name. And I declare to your sleep center, Proverbs 3.24, that says, because you walk in covenant with God, you shall no longer lie down in fear, but it is your Father's good pleasure to give his beloved children sweet sleep. So in Jesus' name, I declare six to eight hours of uninterrupted sleep beginning tonight. I break the power of nightmares, night terrors, night sweats, any kind of restless leg syndrome or anything that would disturb your sleep, but instead sweet sleep to every one of you in the name of Jesus. Now take that hand and put it right back here again. I also speak to every system of your body that has been affected by trauma. And I command your skeletal muscular system, your cardiopulmonary system, your reproductive systems, your nervous system, your lymph system, your limbic system. I command every system of your body that in any way, shape, or form has been affected by trauma to be restored, to be reset back to pre-trauma function. I speak to your endocrine system, and I specifically address your adrenal glands. And in the name of Jesus, I command your adrenal glands to be reset and for the cortisol and the adrenaline pumps in your adrenal glands to quit pumping out. I command for the cortisol levels and the adrenaline levels to come back to what is normal for you in Jesus' name. And I command the inflammation in your nervous system that is called caused fibromyalgia, neuralgia, and chronic nerve pain. I command that inflammation to be healed and restored and no longer be reactive to the cortisol levels in your body in the name of Jesus. I command any muscle memory that you carry from car accidents or injury that still haunts you, I command for that muscle memory to be healed so that the next time you do that which might cause you pain, no pain will be there in Jesus' name. Finally, pray this prayer with me. Holy Spirit, come and fill every area of my life that has been affected by trauma. Fill every empty place. Fill every place that has been wounded with your power, with your love, and with your shalom. I receive your infilling and your power in my life in Jesus' name. Everybody stand up. We got one last thing to do. Tomorrow morning, we're going to walk through this prayer model. I'm going to train you, and, and we're going to do some more tomorrow night. But bring your questions in the morning. Uh, and even we'll probably do some questions tomorrow night, too, for those of you that can't be here tomorrow morning about this. Because I, I love the dialogue of, of asking questions. But we're not going to do that tonight. You've heard me say both this morning as well as tonight, the trauma is all about identity. That we have listened to lies about us for decades because of the things that have happened to us. And so therefore, where do we, where do we get our identity from? We get our identity from who the Father calls us now. So I'm going to say it and you're going to repeat it back to me. And we're going to reset your identity according to your heavenly Father's identity, how he sees you right now. I am a new creation in Christ. All the old has passed away. All things have become new. I am in Jesus. Jesus is in me. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. I am love. I am accepted. I'm adopted into God's family. I'm completely forgiven. I am saved. I am filled with his spirit. I'm kept by his love. I am covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm blessed going in, and I'm blessed coming out. In Jesus' name, 
I am more than a conqueror because Jesus loves me. All things, all things, all things work together for my good because I love God and I'm called according to His purpose. And His purpose for me is to look more and more like Jesus every day. I'm a child of the King. I'm a joint heir with Jesus. I get a share in everything that Jesus gets, which is the whole universe. I have an assignment. I am going to heaven. In the meantime, I also have an assignment. I'm bringing heaven to earth. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. With every principality and power under my feet. If it's under the feet of Jesus, it's under my feet because I've been given power and authority by Jesus to bring his kingdom everywhere I go. Everywhere I go, I bring God's kingdom with me. Everywhere I go, the glory of God goes with me. Everywhere I go, angels follow me because I am blessed, I am loved, I'm no longer defined by my history. I'm defined by who my Father calls me. He calls me His beloved child in whom He is well pleased. Give thanks to God, will you? Hallelujah. Thank you. Annette, Annette could I get you to come up to also uh, to just play for me just a little bit? You know, whenever the... Um, what's it? Whenever Jesus was praying for, was it the centurion? I can't remember, but he said, uh, according, he just took Jesus at his word, remember? He said, just say the word, just say the word, and my, uh, my, my daughter will be healed. Um, sometimes whenever we pray these kind of prayers, we go, you know, was that really effective? Beloved, take this. Take it and receive it. And believe it. Believe and receive what you have prayed tonight and what has been spoken over you, just like that centurion. Just speak the word. Just speak the word, and it will be done. It's done. It is done. It is finished. It is finished. 2,000 years ago, it was finished. And tonight, we have appropriated that for our lives. That past no longer hangs on us like a chain. We are free. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. 